Hello, everyone, and welcome to the IEP Toolkit as we continue to investigate and plan and prepare to be the best advocates we can for our children. Um, as we've discussed over the last month or so, um, we are in a very different place going into the fall IEP planning sessions than we have been in the past. Reason being is that we don't know where our children are right now. What progress have they made? What lack of progress have they made? Are there other areas that need to be addressed and goals identified? Um, and, and how are we going to present this information to school in order to be the best advocate we can be for, for our children? So um, as we talked about the other day, and you just have to send me a message and I will send it to you. This is the template that we have created that you can do one for every, every teacher that your child has. Tell them what happened during distance learning. You know, did your child work independently and was manageable and never had an angry outburst and all that stuff, you can check those boxes. Or like most kids, they were bored. They didn't want to do it. They felt that they were unsupported. They felt like they weren't given materials that they could access. They had stomach aches. They had anxiety. And you had a bunch of freaking out parents who were afraid that their child was falling behind. So this is super helpful. You can do it for every subject that your child has. And you can um, give it to the IEP team as well as giving it to um, each teacher uh, when school actually starts whatever in whatever form it's going to start in. Just so you know that um, today we're going to um, finish a section on um, measurability of of objectives and goals, and then we're going to leave objectives and goals for just a little bit, and we're going to shift our focus to how to make the most out of a, a virtual IEP meeting. We're going to talk about, um, about some of the, the impacts of distance learning that may not be obvious that you're going to need to address in these future IEP meetings. And really, we want to get you armed parents to be the best advocate you can be. You are the most important member of that IEP team. Remember that you are your child's first teacher and you taught them how to talk, how to walk, and you're the one who watches them learn and, and be taught every day. So, um, you know, with, with that, um, let's get into our discussion for today, but I am I am excited about our uh, talking about distance learning, and I'd really like to have uh, you know people send in some messages out or some questions about it because you know my kids are 18 and 20, so their challenges during distance learning are not going to be as applicable to what other parents of younger children experienced. Of course, I have clients with younger children. And, you know, we can talk about some of those challenges, but I would love to hear from all of you. You can just put it in the in the comments, post it on the page, send me a private message, whatever you need. Um, we have lots of resources, happy to share. And, um, you know, let's let's get ready because it's coming. So uh, basically, you know, we we talked about yesterday um, we began our, our our conversation with talking about the difference between measurability and measured and um, and how we are going to quantify progress when we are looking at uh, at IEP goals. And you know that's super, super important because you have to have a starting point, you know where your child is today in order to set objectives and goals for where they should be in the future. And then you put in the accommodations support or supports 
and that levels the playing field so that they have equal access to, to education, so that they get FAPE, free and appropriate public education. If the IEP goals are not appropriate, if the supports and accommodations are not appropriate, if they are not based on real data, then that's a violation of faith. And so this concept of measurable goals and how they're written and how they're measured is critical. And as parents, we have to understand how they should be measured in order to be an appropriate goal to guarantee your child an appropriate education. So all of that being said, um, there are a few myths of measurability, and that's where I wanted to start today. Um, and the first one is, is that if a goal or objective contains a percentage, it's measurable. Well, that's crap. And we did talk a little bit about that yesterday. Um, we're talking about um, when we have goals that say that, you know, Lori will control her behavior 80% of the time. Excuse me, does that mean 80% of the time in one class, 80% of the time that she's in one-on-one -on -one instruction, 80% of the time when she's at recess, or 80% of the school day, or 80% of the school year? Um, you can't measure that. 80% is completely illusory. Um, if, you know, sometimes we see that um, a child will read an expository passage of 500 words and tell the main idea with 90% accuracy 70% of the time. Well, we don't know, again, we can't quantify what 90% accuracy is, and we can't quantify what 70% of the time is without looking at some additional information. And as we talked about the other day, if you have to look at additional information, it's not a valid goal. Um, other ways that um, we see this is that, you know, a student will write a paragraph with 75% accuracy. Well, what does that mean? 75% of the words will be spelled right. 75% of the punctuation will be correct. 75% of the paragraph will be relevant. So this is why percentages don't work, and this is why percentages do not make it measurable, because you don't have the right information to look at them um, and compare to. There's like no backdrop. There's no basis. So that's really, really important. Another myth is that um, if a goal or objective contains technical language or words of art, it must be valid. And, you know, we see these all the time. Um, you know, student will improve the central auditory processing. Well, special ed people know what central auditory processing is, maybe. But remember, this has to pass the substitute teacher test. And the substitute teacher may have no training in special ed. So that could never be an appropriate goal. and improve is not a standard that's measurable. So that, again, is a no-no word. Um, student will demonstrate appropriate interpersonal and communication skills. Well, yeah, we'd love for every kid to behave, but that's not an IEP goal as it's written. Um, you know, student will internalize the principles of democracy. Okay, great. What does that mean? We have no idea. What grade level in internalization of democracy? What, where is this definition coming from of democracy? Where, who, whose perspective do they have to understand it from? Um, and what aspects of democracy? Um, you know, this is, and so again, these, when you have these, these terms of art, as we call them, or words of art in technical language, doesn't automatically make it valid. As a matter of fact, it more than likely automatically makes it invalid. So the other um, thing that we see is when we add a lot of words that sound specific, but they're not. 
And that's to say that, you know, a student will explain a procedure concisely, accurately, and logically without props. Okay, again, these goals have to be individualized. So that's a goal that you could give to every student, to every gen ed and special ed student, and every gen ed or special ed student would do it differently, and most of them would probably accomplish that goal. But how do you measure the progress of doing that? You can't because you have words in there that sound very specific, concisely, accurately, logically, but they mean something different to everyone. And so because of that, it's not quantitative enough, it's not specific enough, it has to be interpreted and independently by the evaluator. And that's going to be subjective, not objective, and that's not a valid goal. So. The third myth that I wanted to talk about, and this is, again, very, very, very common that we see these, but they're not acceptable. And that is when it contains an action verb. And a lot, there's a belief that if it contains an action verb, it must be measurable because you have an action verb. But, you know, um, for example, demonstrating an understanding. Okay, because it starts with demonstrating doesn't mean that you can measure it. It's just something that you're going to be doing. Remember, we talked about how you have you have to have the um, the part of the the goal or objective that makes it specific, that it gives you that makes it observable, the part that that helps you define it and you know, the given, we talked about how you have to have a statement that, you know, that there's a given that something is happening in order for the goal to happen. So, you know, we talked about, you know, given access to the internet, a student will locate 10 sources of information on topic X, okay? So that you have to have that given statement for it to be a, a good goal. Um, we we talked about there's four steps to every measurable goal or objective, and those four steps, I'm just going to go through them again because I can't send this home <laughs> enough times, but they have to reveal what to do to measure whether the goal or objective has been accomplished. They have to yield the same conclusion if measured by different people. They have to allow a calculation of how much progress it represents, and it can be measured without additional information. So if we're going back to the action verb examples that are not appropriate goals, you know, when you have demonstrate an understanding, um, determine high-risk behavior, ask questions to clarify issues, Develop a web to aid comprehension. You know, those are not guarantees of measurability. And it's a myth that if you have those words, that if you have the action words, just like if you have the technical words, that it's an appropriate goal. And they're not most of the time. So how do we select goals? And again, we have to go back to the IDEA. And the purpose of the IDEA, as we just mentioned, is for every child to have a free and appropriate public education space. Um, that's every child with a disability to have a free and appropriate public education. And then, you know, the disputes arise over what's appropriate and what's not. And the, the, the IDEA is very specific that children are not guaranteed best education, if they're gifted, they're not necessarily, you know, entitled to a gifted education. They're entitled to an appropriate education. Um, it, it must be individualized based on what in every individual child needs based on their own individual disability. So 
um, in this great debate over what is appropriate, the IEP team came to be, and, and the IEP team put together a program and evaluates its appropriateness. And the way that we do that is by looking at the following factors to determine if an IEP is appropriate. Number one, you could all guess, is it measurable? Does it address the child's academic and functional needs? Is number two. Number three, does it meet the child's needs to enable involvement and progress in the general curriculum? And four, does it meet each of the child's other education needs. So remember, we're looking at the amount of progress that the child makes on a projected goal. And if it's appropriate, it, in, when you're incorporating the child's unique abilities or inabilities or intellectual skills or shortcomings. Another factor that we can't ignore when we talk about faith action and what happens if a child fails to reach the goal what are we going to do and how is that going to be measured and how is that going to be reported to the team and how often is it going to be reported and how often is it going to be addressed well if a child has an unsuccessful iep they're not meeting their goal and they say well we'll just keep it for the next year and you know he'll catch up he'll catch up that's not appropriate under any circumstances that is not appropriate, it is a clear denial of faith. And that is a lawsuit in the making. So another way that um, IEPs and goals are, are looked at is kind of, you know, by looking at the standards and expectations of the general curriculum and comparing. And this sort of standards-based approach to an IEP, um, it, it has some disadvantages, and those disadvantages need to be recognized and addressed. So first and foremost, um, you know, obviously, if the child, child's unique need is part of the general curriculum and everything's going to align and, and they're going to be able to meet their goal, then, um, you know, then it doesn't even have to be in the IEP. However, if there are accommodations or modifications needed for the child to reach the goal, then they do need to be in the IEP. So a sta the standard IEP-based process may lead parents to believe or feel that striving for Toward grade level academic standards is mandated by federal law, and that that is truly individualized appropriate goals. Even if it's far from the grade or age level of the child. And you do that, and you say, parent, that, okay, I have grade level academic standards that my, my child is. is attempting to meet, and those are mandated by federal law, um, you're inadvertently compromising your child. You're also compromising your ability to advocate for your child because that is not unique. That is not individual. It doesn't, it, it doesn't start with where one child, your child, is when you're writing the IEP talking about a whole grade of children. Um, the other issue with this sort of standard-based IEP is that it doesn't deal with some of the um, emotional um, issues or functional skills, basic skills, um, where, st where students also have needs. You know, such as put functional skills like putting on their clothing or tying their shoes or taking their lunch from the lunch bucket out and putting it on the table and spreading out the napkin and those steps to eating. 
Um, some kids don't know how, don't understand how to cross the street. So those things may have to be in an IEP. And if you're just looking at a standards-based IEP, you're not going to, to help the child with those individual uh, uh, skills that they're lacking. Um, the, you know, a lot of advocates believe that those sort of functional skills can be dealt with in a general ed classroom just as a matter of course. And again, maybe in some cases they can, but in most cases they can't. Um, and so it's really important parents, and you do have to do the work here to make sure that you understand your child's disability, you understand where they are right now, and that you use our, our toolkit to plan and prepare to be an advocate. So um, there, you know, so there are risks to these sort of standard-based IEPs. Um, remember that the curriculum is, is written for children without disabilities. And if we're using a standard-based IEP, then our students may be getting access to a very watered-down version of the general ed curriculum, and that isn't what we want. We want to give them supports and accommodation so they have equal access. Um, the, um, so a huge part of appropriate means, and I'm just going to read this because I think it's important, that the services are focused on meeting the unique educational needs of that child. And this is not the case with standard-based IEPs. So we can't be unique enough. We can't be individual enough. We cannot be narrowly tailored enough to be the best advocates for our child that we can be. And, and we, if we are allowing this sort of standards-based IEP of, for the general curriculum to be the foundation of our children's IEPs. So I caution you about these myths that we just talked about. And I, if you have any questions, please message me, send them to me, um, email me, call me, um, and, um, and I will be happy to address anything you can. We are doing IEP reviews for um, students. Um, we, we're taking appointments all the time. And um, we're really here to help you be the best you uh, so that your child can be the best of him or herself. So at, at Kirsch Daskus Lab Group, we do take a different approach to different learners. We hope we can help you, empower you, and get you um, plan, prepared, and, and the best advocate you can be um, when you go to your child's IEP meeting. And tomorrow, as I said, we'll talk about challenges to distance learning and challenges uh, in, in baseline data and how we're going to um, really formulate this IEP if we are distance learning again. So I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful day. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye.